We are back with CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky. I want to start there. Are you for mandating a vaccine on a federal level? Um, you know, that's something that I think the administration is looking into. It's something that I think we're, we're looking to see approval of from the vaccine. Um, overall, I think in general, I am all for um, more vaccination. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have nothing further to say on that except that we're looking into those policies. And, and quite honestly, as people are doing that locally, um, those, are, those are individual local decisions as well. Right. But you're in the medical field and you can hear the pushback from people who say I need to determine what is put inside my body uh, with my doctor so you get that pushback I completely understand the pushback, and I also understand that this is not unlike other things that are mandated, other vaccines that are mandated for school-going children, for healthcare personnel. I'm mandated every year as I work in the hospital to get a flu vaccine. So um, there's, I, I understand both perspectives in that story. It's, it's, I understand. But why is it then, Dr. Walensky, that such a high percentage of medical personnel are not taking the vaccine? Um, yeah, you know, again, this is a very heterogeneous country. And so um, if you look at certain parts of the country, there are high levels of vaccination. And if you look at other levels of the country, other parts of the country, there are lower levels of the vaccination. Um, I think it's really important to understand that everyone has a different reason for either wanting the vaccine or not wanting the vaccine. So this is not about, you know, why is this demographic not getting it? Some people haven't had access. Some people haven't had time off. Some people don't understand its benefits. Some people are worried about the side effects. So I think as we go um, and, and try and provide information to people who are not yet vaccinated, I feel like it's our job to understand what their hesitancies are and then to use information that we have that they are interested in to try and um, use that information so that at the end of a discussion, they will want the vaccine. I've talked to a lot of medical experts, a lot of people I trust who say the, the profile for these vaccines is really great as far as uh, efficacy standpoint. However, there are indications of uh, pockets of, and whether that's hundreds or thousands, of people who have problems. There are people who say they've linked it to deaths, uh, whether the number is very small. Um, are those things being looked at by the CDC? Is that investigation happening? We don't, we don't hear about it, obviously. Absolutely. We are watching this incredibly carefully through numerous different vaccine safety systems. This vaccine adverse event system, um, we have a VSA system, a passive reporting system. We have what we call a vaccine safety data link that is collaborating with hospitals. We are watching this extraordinarily carefully. And what I would say is um, we have uh, vaccinated 164 million Americans. Um, so we have an extraordinary amount of data um, since December as we started getting uh, vaccinating people. And we've been able to find very, very rare signals when they've occurred. And so I have extraordinary confidence in the safety of these vaccines. Yeah, which makes the question about the FDA and authorization seem really important. Uh, if it's about shelf life, it seems like it's a little too long. I want to turn to schools. There's a lot of parents who send in questions all across the country. They're wondering what it's going to look like for their kids and masks, especially for young kids, two, three, four, five, six. Here's uh, Josh. Why is the CDC not looking at the emotional impacts and the other physical impacts that having a mask on a child as young as three or four, or five, six, seven years old? Nobody seems to be talking about the emotional or physical impacts um, that, that having a mask on a child for that long is having, and the CDC should be looking at this. Why are they not? Are you not, or are you? Brett, thank you for that question. Josh, thank you for that question. Here's what I can tell you. First of all, I have three kids myself, and I completely understand. We want our kids back in school, and that is so very important. Over the summer, we've had numerous summer school outbreaks that have occurred when uh, masks are not worn. We've had, uh, jurisdictions have had to close schools because there are so many clusters happening in the school system. So my primary goal is to get all our kids back 
in person safely for full-time learning um, and to do so and to be able to keep the schools open to prevent those clusters from happening in school. Right now, the best way to do that is to have everybody masked because we do have disease in the community. And hopefully, as we have vaccinations for kids and less disease in the community, we'll be able to, uh, to scale back on the mask wearing. But those are cases, right? Those aren't hospitalizations and those aren't deaths. Do you have a percentage of kids, young kids, hospitalizations and deaths? Um, you know, we are following that very carefully. What I will say is that um, certainly the kids do better than adults do. Um, the older people, the, the more hospitalizations have occurred in demographics that are over the age of 65. Um, but we are seeing illness in some kids who get, um, who get uh, COVID. And it's illness at the rates or even higher than the rates of influenza. So in my mind, as a vaccine-preventable disease, we want to make sure that our kids stay in school wearing a mask, and then when the vaccines, should the vaccines become available for our children, to vaccinate them to keep them safe and healthy. All right, here's what the head of the teachers union uh, said about opening schools in the fall. Vaccination is the number one gold standard um, that we need to, you know, bring back our masks for schools. We're going to keep kids safe. We're going to keep our members safe, and we're going to try to open up schools. Try to open up schools. It sounds like a maybe uh, from Randy Weingarner. The NEA obviously is a union advocating for its members, and that's important. And it's an important stakeholder to the CDC, obviously setting guidelines for schools in the fall. But but who are the advocates for the children? and the parents, uh, which teachers unions have not been, at least in, in that particular question. And uh, as the CDC prepares recommendations for in-person learning, uh, especially for kids under 12, as you heard Josh talk about, what's the scientific basis for masking young children? You know, I think that we have to, when we, we have seen in schools that when the children come into schools with disease in the community, it can spread in schools if the children are not masked. And so when we have high rates of disease in the community, we are going to see some cases in the school. But and it's more comfort to, for the teachers in the, those schools. Um, you know, a lot of these kids, first of all, there is some disease in kids. These kids go back to homes where they have parents, they have immunocompromised parents, they have other children in the household. So really what we're trying to do is prevent spread in the schools and in the communities. And so, you know, generally what we're trying to do is get our kids back in full-time full in-person learning um, and to decrease the amount of disease in the communities so that our children can be back in school. Last thing, uh, you know, I hear from a lot of people that say, you know, there's one thing and then another thing, and we, we hear it about vaccinations and masks, but we also hear it about, uh, for example, one woman wrote in, my in-laws live in Austria. They cannot come here to see their six-month-old baby because of the EU travel ban. Even as migrants come across the southern border uh, from other countries with more COVID and worse vaccine performance, and they're allowed in. Is that a problem, Dr. Walensky? We're working um, in, at the CDC to provide technical assistance for all areas of travel, as well as to provide technical assistance at the southern border. So as people come in, we are keeping uh, migrants, as well as those communities, as safe as possible with the technical assistance and infection prevention guidelines from the CDC. But do you know the surge, how the surge of illegal immigrants with COVID is affecting the overall rate? You know, it sounds like the percentages down there on the border are astronomical. Yeah, you know, I would say that the per percentages in the southern part of this country are really quite high, um, and I don't necessarily think we can attribute all of that to what's going on at the southern border. I think what we really need to do is spend our time getting our communities vaccinated, to getting our individuals vaccinated, to uh, prevent disease from transmitting in our communities. Lightning round here. Which vaccine is best against the Delta variant? Uh, I don't think we have data to suggest that one vaccine is better than another. So I would say um, there are, uh, you know, three vaccines. We're lucky to have three vaccines that are available and um, get the information that you need to feel comfortable um, rolling up your sleeves and getting vaccinated. Yeah, well, you're going to talk to your doctor about that. Um, but if there's a mandate, it, it, you're not picking one over another as far as the Delta variant is what you're saying. But if you let's say you got the J&J, &J, is it okay to get the Pfizer uh, after that? because you want to. 
Um, right now, we don't have uh, full data from J&J &J or the FDA to make an evaluation on that assessment. Which kind of question. leads to that question about data and details. I mean, it's been a long time, and you have a lot of uh, 170 million people that, or 64. Don't you guys have a lot of data as of, as of this point? So the um, FDA is looking at the data from the companies uh, that are conducting these analyses. The CDC is not conducting crossover studies, as we call them, getting one vaccine and then getting a boost from a second. So um, the FDA have access to those data, and as they make those decisions, I am certain those data will become Should public. Should we avoid big crowds at this point? I mean, are we going to have an NFL season, an NHL season, an NBA season? Um, I am really hopeful that we will. I, you know, what I think is really clear is that um, if we unify together as a country, um, if we take the steps that are necessary to squash the amount of disease that is there now, we can do so in a matter of weeks. Um, if we all get vaccinated, um, if we wear masks, until then, there is so much that can be done in such a short period of time to squash this, um, and I would really love to see um, kickoff season. Last thing, Israel is already doing a booster for people over 60. Are we going to do that? Uh, we are working uh, and looking at the data. As I mentioned, we have numerous cohorts following tens of thousands of people across the United States. We're looking at those data every week, every two weeks. We're collaborating with international uh, partners such as Israel and the UK and many others to look at their, those data. And one thing I will say is that when the data demonstrate that we are ready to give boosters, um, the government will be ready. We are planning right now. Dr. Walensky, we appreciate you giving us an extended amount of time. As you can hear by all the questions around the country, there's some confusion and a lot of concern, uh, but we hope that um, you can come back sometime and continue to fill us in. I'd absolutely be happy to. Thanks for having me.